Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Just Infrastructure Speaker Series. My name is Anita Chan, and along with Kara Kara Halios and Indu Gupta, my fellow co-leads of the Just Infrastructures Initiative, we will be your hosts for today's event. For those who don't know us just yet, Just Infrastructures is an initiative created by researchers to interrogate the complex interactions between people, algorithms, and AI-driven systems. You can learn more about us and see more info about our next event with Nate Matias on governing human and machine behavior on March 10 at our website, just-infras.illinois.edu. A link has been added to the chat and you can see our full spring calendar of talks there too. We would like to thank our wonderful funders and sponsors for supporting this programming. They include the Computer Science Department, the School of Information Sciences, the Granger College of Engineering's SRI program, Capital One, and the Community Data Clinic. We would also like to thank our additional non-financial co-sponsors, and you can find them listed on our website. To ask a question, please use the Q&A box. We'll have a Q&A session at the very end of the talk. Closed captioning and American Sign Language support is also available. Please use the chat function to request any tech support and a note that this talk is being recorded. I'd like to now ask you to join me in a land acknowledgement. As a land grant institution, the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign has a responsibility to acknowledge the historical context in which it exists and the exclusions and erasures of indigenous peoples on whose lands it is located. We are currently on the lands of several nations, including Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Vea, Miami, Muscoutin, Ottawa, Salk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to begin the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Acknowledgements invite us to ask, what does it mean to live in a post and neo-colonial world? What did it take for us to get here? And how can we be accountable to our part in history? We'd now like to turn it over to our esteemed presenters. We're extremely honored to have Catherine D'Ignazio and Lauren Klein with us here today. Catherine D'Ignazio is an assistant professor of urban science and planning at MIT. She's also director of the Data and Feminism Lab, which uses data and computational methods to work towards gender and racial equity. Lauren Klein is an associate professor in the departments of English and quantitative theory and methods at Emory University, where she also directs the Digital Humanities Lab and works at the intersection of digital humanities, data science, and gender and race studies. Together, they are the authors of the widely popular 2020 book, Data Feminism, released with MIT Press, which has enamored audiences by charting a course for a more ethical and empowering data science practice. Please join me in welcoming Drs. Catherine D'Ignazio and Lauren Klein. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it, it's a huge honor to be here. Um, and, you know, we just want to say that we're deeply grateful to the hosts of this series uh, for all their care and attention to detail and for making us feel welcome in a time when presenting on Zoom is not <laughs> very welcoming, <laughs> typically. Or when you do visits, they're not they're not very warm and welcoming. So we feel warm and welcomed uh, from this visit. So thank you so much for that. Um, and thank you for um, inviting us to be part of what I think is a just extremely important um, lecture series. Um, so my name is Catherine Demasio, uh, as we said, um, and Lauren and I are going to talk with you a little bit today about our book, Data Feminism. Um, and we won't spend a lot of time reintroducing ourselves since Anita already did that. Um, the arc of the talk is really, we want to just explain a little bit about our motivations for, for writing the book, to situate it in regards to some of the broader conversations that are happening right now around data, ethics, computing, AI. Um, we want to ground you a little bit with the, what we mean by the feminism of the data of feminism. Um, and then we'll talk about some really specific examples that come out of the book. Um, to give you a sense of the, 
the flavor uh, and the way and the tone in which we try to address uh, some of these issues. Um, and so I think the one last thing to note before we dive in is that Data Feminism is an open access book. So if you go to the website uh, for the book, datafeminism.io, which is on this slide, um, you can you see a big link there that says read the book and that'll take you right to the version on uh, MIT Press's PubPub where you can read it. <clears throat> um, so I think without further ado, we will just jump right in. Hi, everyone. Um, I just want to echo Catherine and thanking our hosts for having us here and thanking everyone for listening on this Wednesday. It took me a minute because I feel like that's the time of <laughs> that's 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 the times. Um, so as Catherine mentioned, we just want to begin by situating the book within this broader body of work that is together um, trying to hold corporate and government actors accountable for all sorts of sexist, racist, classist data products. So you could think here of face detection systems that can't see women of color, hiring algorithms that demote applicants that went to all women's schools, child abuse detection algorithms that punish poor parents and more. And just at the bottom of the screen to note, you see some of the other projects that have actually done the work on some of those specific issues that I just named, and really with their work inspired us to write the book. You know, our inspiration uh, was uh, in large part due to the fact that examples like these just keep on coming. Um, you know, corporations, and you hear this line a lot, they see data as the new oil. Um, and they mean this in a good way, um, that data to them seems like the sort of untapped natural resource that can lead to profit once processed and refined. Um, but women, and particularly women of color, as well as indigenous people, immigrant communities, LBGTQ folks, and more, they experience this very same process of data extraction um, because really, you know, if you're talking about oil, that's really the, that's the metaphor we should be thinking about. Um, they experience the same process of data extraction as just the same old oppression. Um, and we are by no means the first ones to have made the case that this oppression is real, um, that it is ongoing, and that it is necessary, really necessary to dismantle. And what we try to do in the book is explain how feminism and intersection excuse me, intersectional feminism in particular, has been focused on this issue, um, focused on dismantling instances of oppression and the forces of power that cause um, these instances of oppression for a very, very long time. So speaking out against the same old oppression, as many of these inspiring folks have been doing for about you know, the past five to 10 years, we've seen a really growing pushback in this vein. Um, but this speaking out carries consequences. Um, and so we just wanted to draw to your attention a case that you may or may not have heard of, of Dr. Timni Gebru, um, who until recently, she was the co-lead of Ethical Artificial Intelligence, uh, the group at Google. Um, Dr. Gebru is known for her scholarship in machine vision, as well as her work on diversity, equity, and inclusion issues in the field of AI. Um, she's actually one of the co-founders of Black in AI, which is a really important um, community for Black researchers and in artificial intelligence. Um, and so she and her team at Google had recently been approved to submit this particular research paper to a conference. Uh, then leadership suddenly reversed their decision, uh, demanded that they retract their paper, which was about um, the dangers of uh, uh, large-scale uh, language processing models and AI. Um, and Dr. Gebru, in responding to that request for retraction, um, said, we, like, I need answers for why, why are you doing this? And also, by the way, like, why are you dragging your feet on all these equity and inclusion issues? Um, and Google promptly responded by firing her. Um, and so we bring this case to your attention um, because it's um, particularly, it's like a particular moment in time uh, for this idea of AI ethics, uh, particularly when a very prominent uh, black woman 
is fired from one of the largest uh, corporations, tech corporations in the world, um, to great uh, backlash. <laughs> so uh, more than 2,500 Google employees have signed a petition um, supporting Timney and uh, demanding transparency. 4,000 academics and AI researchers have signed that petition. Uh, recruiting firms, Black-led recruiting firms have dropped Google, um, citing moral concerns over their treatment of Black people. Um, and in fact, nine members of Congress have written a letter demanding accountability for this firing. Um, but there's still not an answer. And in fact, just this past week, uh, Google fired the, co the other co-lead of this same group, Meg Mitchell, who's a white woman. Um, and she is, uh, that, so that team has now been sort of um, dismantled. Um, so this treatment is super, I mean, it's, it's egregious and, and we should all be outraged and we should keep demand, demanding transparency and we should keep demanding that these corporations do something other than diversity washing. Um, but we also, so in an, a separate piece, some colleagues of mine and I, Caitlin Turner, Danielle Wood, have pointed out that this is not an isolated case. Um, so we published a recent piece um, called the Abuse and Misogyn War Playbook, um, which describes how in fact what Google has done in this case is not, this is not like one case, this is a pattern. Um, and it's so common that it's a centuries old playbook used against black women who speak truth to power. So the question I wanna begin to ask uh, right now, and we'll continue to sort of explore in the talk is why does Dr. Gebru's case matter for AI and for the field of computer science? Um, and sort of how does it relate to this conversation that we wanna have about feminism and computer science? Um, and so one of the things that we say in the book is that feminism both in theory and as a practice demands that we ask who questions. Um, so questions like data science by whom, um, data science for whom, data science about whom, uh, data science with whose values. The answers to these are kind of uncomfortable and we talk about this in the book. Um, but the question remains sort of why do these why are these feminist questions and I think you know hopefully by the end of the presentation you'll begin to understand why. And in order to get there, um, I just want to spend a few minutes to do some level setting about how we use the term feminism in the book. And I'm going to start um, with Beyonce. Um, never a bad idea to start with her. What you see is an image from the 2014 MTV Music Awards. Um, this is when Beyonce projected the word feminist behind her. Uh, she also sings about feminism in her song Flawless, which is what she was performing in the image that you see. And in the song, she samples a speech by the Nigerian author Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, who was quoting what turns out to be actually the American Heritage Dictionary definition of the term. So you hear in the song, feminist, the person who believes in equal rights for men and women and non-binary people. Um, so what we get from this definition at its basic, basic level, feminism is a belief in equality. So the dictionary also gives a second definition. So if we have this idea that feminism is a belief and it's a belief in equality for all of the genders, um, there's this second definition, um, which is that feminism is organized activity on behalf of women's and non-binary people's rights and interests in the sense that if you believe in equal rights for all the genders, all you have to do is look around and see that those equal rights have not been realized in the current world that we live in. Um, so this means there's a commitment to action. There's a commitment to political action to realize that world of equal rights. Um, and then feminism has a third definition, which is um, for me, one of the most exciting ones, uh, which is that it's a set of theories and ideas, um, meaning that it is a kind of intellectual heritage. It's like knowledge and writing and thinking and art and activism that we inherit over decades and decades. Um, and so these theories begin by thinking through issues of inequality with respect to sex and gender. But then the past 40 years of scholarship and also our current political reality have brought many more dimensions of inequality into the equation. And these include race, class, sexuality, ability, and so many more things. 
So this brings us back around to this idea of intersectional feminism and how our view and what we say in the book is that feminism in the year 2021 must be understood as intersectional. So many of you uh, may well know um, intersectionality is this term coined by the legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw which she uses to explain how social inequality cannot be explained by only one dimension of difference like gender. So when we're talking about inequality or oppression um, or privilege for that matter, um, we have to be talking about the intersection of the many factors and forces that produce it. So these include racism, these include classism, these include colonialism and so on. So, the key thing to understand about intersectionality, um, and I, which we want to sort of uh, make explicit here, because it's a thing that's often overlooked in casual invocations of the term, um, but is really important for understanding how we use it in the book, is that intersectionality doesn't just describe markers of individual identity. So it doesn't just mean, for example, like I am a white cisgender woman, you know, I live in the US South, in the global north, you know, it doesn't just mean sort of the, these aspects of my identity. That's not what intersectionality is precisely describing. What it is describing are the structural forces of power and their intersection that create the effects that I experience as a result of my identity intersecting identities. And it's been the work of women of color feminists and black feminists in particular that have foregrounded this conversation about the root cause of the privilege or oppressions that I may or may, may not face as I move through the world. Um, they've really worked to foreground this conversation about forces of power. So in short, um, intersectional feminism, which provides the underlying framework for our book, isn't only um, about issues of gender. It's not even only about women. Um, it's about power. It's about who has it and who doesn't. And in today's world, data is power. Um, you see this in the idea of data is the new oil. And you also see this in the idea of data as the same old oppression. And so intersectional feminism, when applied to data science, can help that power be challenged and changed. So our argument is really um, that data science needs feminism um, in intersectional feminism in particular, if we ever hope to overturn these power imbalances that we see in our data sets and our data systems. Um, so as we were writing the book, uh, we, you know, asked ourselves what we've learned from our own schooling and feminist scholarship, um, our participation in various activist communities. Um, we did a scan of uh, various literature uh, related to uh, both feminist thinking and theory, but also the application of that. So we paid particular attention to fields that have really tried to operationalize feminist thinking. So like feminist geography and GIS or feminist human computer interaction or feminist design, feminist economics. Um, and, and again, it's like the exciting thing of feminism is actually it's, it's, it's so transdisciplinary. You can find it across many different fields in academia, as well as of course, in many different spaces outside of academia. <clears throat> um, and so drawing from that, um, we came up with these seven principles that for us encapsulate the most important aspects of feminism as they relate to data science. Um, and the goal here, like I said, is to operationalize feminism. So really thinking about how do we uh, inform the work of people who are working with data or who want to work with data or people who want to refuse to work with data. Um, and so we don't have time to go through all the principles today, but maybe the important thing to say here is that this is also how the book is structured. Um, and so each of these principles is one chapter in the book. Um, and what we try to do is, um, again, we're, we were sort of writing this book for newcomers. We were trying to imagine that like folks who are coming to this book may not have much schooling in feminism nor in potentially data science. Um, and so in each chapter we introduce some of the um, feminist thinkers who have really informed that principle. Um, and then we also introduce some of the people in the world who are using data 
uh, in various ways that relate to that principle. And so we try to demonstrate in action uh, what some of these principles look like in relationship to data, um, as well as the current data science practices and norms that they challenge. Um, and so maybe the one thing to say about the principles is that one of the things you'll see is that the first two principles have to do with power, um, and examine power and challenge power. And that is of course, as we've said, because this sort of analysis of power is so central uh, to the feminist project that really like lays the groundwork um, for all of the principles that come later. Um, so from here, we're going to talk a little bit uh, about some of the individual principles and some of the examples that we talk about in the book that, that illustrate some of those principles. So in the first chapter, which is about examining power, we talk about this project that you see pictured here. It's called the Library of Missing Data Sets, and it's by the artist Mimi Onuoha. Missing data sets, it's a term that Onuoha has coined to describe data sets that a reasonable person might expect to exist um, because they address issues of pressing social need, but because of a range of factors, they don't actually exist in real life. Um, so data sets like trans people killed or injured in instances of hate crime, there's no comprehensive data set on this. Um, people excluded from public housing because of criminal records another issue um, that institutions, political institutions don't care enough about um, to collect data on. Or, you know, for a more topical, topical example that appeared after the book uh, was released, but so many data sets relating to COVID, right? A gender and race breakdown of the number of people receiving COVID vaccines in the United States. Um, you know, now that these racial disparities have been started to, have started to be pointed out, certain cities, states, municipalities have begun to collect data on this in a local setting, but there is no national database devoted to collecting data on this. Um, just to back up a little bit and talk a little bit more about what you're actually looking at, um, Onuoha exhibits the library of missing data sets in two ways. Uh, the first is a GitHub repository, which is what you see on the right. That's just the white screenshot. And you can actually Google that and find that right now. And then there's also an art installation. That's the, the file cabinet you see on the left. The files are labeled with the titles of each of the missing data sets. And the idea is you enter the gallery, you walk up to the file cabinet or pre-COVID, you would have walked up to the file cabinet. You would tab through the file folders, find one that is labeled with an issue that seems interesting or important to you, open up the folder, but the folder is empty. And the reason they're empty, and this is the point that Onuoha makes in writing as well um, in her artist statement, is because of the profound imbalance of power with respect to data collection in the world. Um, so this imbalance of power is what determines what data are collected and what are not, or more generally, what research is conducted and what research is not. You know, governments have this power, moneyed institutions have this power, minoritized groups do not. And this is why a feminist approach to data science begins with this analysis of power. Because far too often, the data sets that we can easily access, and in turn, the questions that they prompt, have already been affected, and in some ways, many ways, overdetermined by the imbalances of power in the world. So, this example um, comes from the second chapter of data feminism, and it's about the principle of challenging power. <clears throat> um, and this also relates to missing data and missing data sets. Um, and it also relates to the topic of feminicide in Mexico, um, but which is a worldwide phenomenon. So feminicides are the gender related killings of women and girls. Uh, they include cis and trans women. Um, and they're legally, so feminicide is legally defined as a crime, uh, actually in a number of Latin American countries right now, over the past decade, there's been huge uh, changes in legislation because of partially the strength of the Latin American feminist movement really pushing us to the top of their agenda. Um, and um, although, so like, despite the fact that they're uh, legally defined and recognized by the state as a crime, 
um, they are still the subject of public anger in Latin America. Um, and you can go look at the hashtag ni una menos, like not one less uh, woman, basically. Um, um, because of the way in which the state uh, basically neglects to fully implement its own laws and provisions in the sense that it's on the books that feminicide is a crime, um, but the state isn't measuring the scale of the problem and they're not actually taking steps to uh, prevent, reduce, um, uh, care for um, uh, the disproportionate deaths of uh, women. Um, and so in the book, we tell the story of Maria Salguero, who um, she does, I mean, I would say, I, I wanna always say she's an activist, but she's not. And she's actually said, I am not an activist. <laughs> she is a person. Um, who she has resolved to head straight towards the problem and to collect the missing data herself. Um, and so starting in uh, 2015, what Maria started doing um, is tabulating from news reports, um, the deaths of women across the entire geographic scope of Mexico. Um, so she spends two to four hours a day logging these feminicides on uh, this Google map. Um, she um, actually in this, time, so she's been doing this for over five years at this point, um, she has uh, developed the largest public available archive of feminicide in the Mexican context. Um, so she's helped families locate loved ones. She's provided data to journalists and to NGOs. Um, and she's even been called to testify in front of Mexico's Congress multiple times about this, um, about the issue. Um, and so in the book, we talk about this kind of work as um, what we call feminist counter data. So this activist, so we characterize the, the data collection as activists. So it's activist data collection that steps in when the state and other institutions have systematically failed to ensure the basic safety of their population. Um, and so this idea of counter data uh, represents one way to use data to challenge power. Um, and you know, it's an important thing to say, well, maybe actually before I go to this slide, I think it's important to note that there's, there's a big, big, big caveat here. <laughs> so although we talk about counter data, um, we don't mean to suggest that the solution to any social problem is to go out and collect more data. Um, in the particular case of feminicide, this is a strategy that makes sense. And it's not only for Maria Salguero, but for many other activists who are working on the topic. Um, but in fact, of course, like in the book, we talk about data as a double-edged sword because of course, by collecting data, particularly if it has to do with uh, minoritized populations, you can be making people visible to a state that, um, uh, that may want to, to harm or target those folks. Um, so counter data though is, you know, there's, once you start looking for counter data, there are many counter data projects out there and a lot of them are actually coming out of uh, journalism, both journalism, social movements and activism. Um, and so Lauren mentioned COVID-19 and counter data. Um, some of the most interesting sort of uh, COVID data has come from counter data projects. So um, things like the COVID tracking project, um, which was uh, a civil society attempt to have a national database of, uh, of COVID cases and deaths when the government was not doing that, <laughs> um, which actually they've recently, I don't know if folks have seen this, but they've recently uh, decided to shudder uh, in relation to the new administration, which I guess reflects their confidence that maybe the new administration would do a better job of tracking COVID data, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but other important efforts as well, like data for black lives, which were inventorying who is releasing data um, on the basis like about race and ethnicity disparities with COVID, um, uh, disparities in Indian country, um, all of these have been missing data sets throughout uh, the crisis, which make it really challenging to actually measure the scope and scale of disparities as well as, as, well as to target um, sort of particular equity-based responses. So another project that actually could be considered a, a counter data collection and analysis effort um, is this one that you see here undertaken by San Francisco's anti-eviction mapping project. Um, we actually talk about this project in the context of our chapter on pluralism, um, the importance of sort of bringing many different people and their perspectives to the table when doing data science work. 
Since 2013, the AEMP has worked in collaboration with tenants' rights organizations and community groups in order to collect and map data about the eviction crisis in the Bay Area. And I should also note, I mean, everything now seems touched by COVID, but you know, when they began this project, eviction was particularly a problem in the Bay Area because of the uh, incursion of tech companies and the salaries that they paid enabled most people to raise the rent or tech workers to afford you know, very high rents where anyone who did not work for those tech companies did not. Um, now we're seeing the issue of eviction in response to COVID you know, becoming a national, a pressing national concern. So what you're actually looking at is, is a map um, that indicates all of the places where a person or a family was evicted. Those are the red dots that you see. And then the blue dots indicate a place where the AEMP has also interviewed one of the people who was evicted from that particular place. And if you click on one of the blue dots, it brings up one of these interviews, their, vi their video interviews. And that's actually uh, who you see on the right in that uh, screenshot is one of the people who was evicted from her home, uh, a Midtown resident named Phyllis Bowie. And in the book, we contrast the AEMP map with the work of the Eviction Lab, uh, which is based at Princeton. Um, the Eviction Lab's goal is to present a national picture of the eviction crisis. And I should say at the outset, uh, this is a totally uh, worthy goal. And it's actually, it's a really, it's a valuable project and I, their, their work is really interesting. But the difference and the contrast you wanna draw out is in terms of process. So the Eviction Lab's maps derived from seemingly bigger data. Um, so the map, you just take a look at it and you would think that it presents a more comprehensive picture of the problem of eviction in the United States. It's the whole United States. It seems to have more dots on it. It even looks a little bit more scientific and sort of flag that, we'll come back to that point in a minute. Um, but the AEMP has shown that national real estate databases, like the ones that the eviction lab uses for their data, significantly undercount evictions. Um, and so you can just think for just an instant about why this might be true. First of all, the real estate industry not really looking forward to counting more evictions than they absolutely have to. It reflects badly on their business, their industry. Um, if lots of people are getting evicted, um, that would probably uh, bring on unwanted attention. Second of all, um, you can think, and I, you know, especially when we talk to student groups, you can think about all of the ways that you can get evicted without actually being served with a formal eviction paper, right? Um, like your landlord can just not fix your broken bathroom or the leak in your ceiling. Like they can come and like lurk in your lobby and threaten you. They can raise the rent. You know, these are all ways that you know, that we know can sort of get you out of your home, but they're not registered in a data set that is only tracking legal, sort of legally certified and registered eviction. But because the AEMP works with local community groups, um, so the organizations where people come and they say, help me, this is happening to me, and then the AEMP tabulates that experience as data, um, they, the AEMP has actually gathered um, much larger, um, admittedly messier, um, but actually much more accurate data that documents a greater extent of the problem at hand. And in the book, we talk about this as what is gained by embracing pluralism, this sort of richer, more contextualized sense of what is happening on the ground. But so when we are embracing pluralism, um, then this, this question does come up in any kind of uh, design process. Um, you know, you're, you're creating some kind of information system, software product data system. Um, you can't bring everybody in, um, particularly for pro products that like, you know, scale to many, many users. Um, so you can't bring everybody into that process. So whose voices do we prioritize? Um, and feminist design has a really clear answer to this question. Um, and so following the work of Sandra Harding, Patricia Hill Collins, Shaowen Bartzell, uh, a feminist design perspective takes power into account, meaning that like it uses an analysis of power to make that decision as well as to make many other design decisions. Um, and it centers the experiences of people at the edges and the margins first and foremost. Um, so thinking about making uh, decisions and design from the outside in. 
Um, so here we're really, and especially in this chapter, we're really thinking about like, how do we have a better, more robust participatory process uh, for data science? And so this image that you're looking at, this is kind of like a imaginary histogram of the users of your system. Um, and whereas most people, you know, say you're like uh, building some kind of system and you're like, okay, you know, the majority of people fall into these categories. And so we're gonna design the system to work for them. And by doing so, we're gonna cover about like 80%, you know, we're gonna meet the needs of about 80% of the population. Um, and so feminist design would actually say, well, this is exactly the opposite of what we need to do. Uh, what we need to do is work directly with people who are at the edges and the margins first. Um, and by doing so, design a system that um, is more robust for, for everybody. And that's actually how we can really address these kinds of uh, power imbalances rather than reinscribe them into our systems. Um, and in this, this is very similar to the principle of the design justice network, um, which is this one. We center the voices of those who are directly impacted by the outcomes of the design process. Um, and so that's just a plug for Sasha Costanza Chak's uh, talk uh, later on in this uh, lecture series, if you wanna learn more about design justice. Um, but these are the folks um, who we should be working to build relationships with, who we put on the advisory boards of our products, um, who we make our uh, research projects and our data systems accountable to. Okay. Um, so we have one last uh, big example to talk about, and I want to pivot a little bit here um, because the previous examples have focused mostly on the issue of power and people, right? So the people who have power and the people who don't. But another really key idea that comes from feminism relates to more conceptual structures of power and more specifically binary structures that are defined by a hard distinction between two groups. So feminist theory over the past, I don't know, 40 years um, has helped to show how these binary distinctions are usually hiding a hierarchy with one group on the top and the other on the bottom. And then once you see that hierarchy, you can actually start to understand why that hard line between the groups is there in the first place. It's there to enforce the distinction to ensure that one group stays on the top and the other on the bottom. And so if you wanna make this a little bit more concrete, you can think about the idea of you know, man or versus woman, right? This is the obvious reference point. And this was in fact the starting point for feminist theorists because it's a clear example of both a false binary and an unequal hierarchy, right? There are more than two genders and among them, no gender is better than any of the others. But one of the key moves of feminist theorists is to take this critique of the gender binary, first of all, to sort of take this hierarchy and rotate it so that you're no longer talking about a hierarchy. And second of all, to just collapse it, right? So there's no more division between any particular group. Um, so feminist theorists likes to take that move, the collapsing of the hierarchy and the dismantling of binaries and use it to question other similar structures that we encounter in the world. So you can think of the distinction between nature and culture, um, between subject and object, or the example that I wanna talk about right now, which is the distinction between reason and emotion. So um, in the sort of Anglo Western context in which we, Catherine and I have been trained, we've been taught that reason is somehow better than emotion. And we see this play out in data in general and data visualization in particular. So um, best practices for data visualization often involve a clean design, a minimalist aesthetic, you know, presenting just the facts. But you know, why are these our best practices, especially when research in that very same field, in the field of information visualization, has shown that we interpret these aesthetic choices just as emotionally. Um, we tend to believe that minimal charts, sort of scientific looking charts, are actually more truthful than they actually are. Um, or we tend to trust a chart more when it includes a source line. It doesn't matter that if the source line actually points to a real data set or a real source, we just trust it more. I'm thinking of work here by uh, Jessica Holman, for example, uh, or Helen Kennedy. We can uh, put some of those or drop those in the chat a little bit later. Um, but I just wanna talk for a couple more minutes about the opposite. So visualizations that deliberately leverage emotion. Um, and so that's what this example helps us talk about. 
So uh, the large the large image that you see is actually it's a screenshot of an animated visualization. You can actually it's by the design firm Periscopic uh, of the number of gun related deaths in the United States in a particular calendar year. And actually, you can Google that and you can watch it while I'm talking. I will not be insulted. Um, but if you uh, if you just want to listen. <laughs> um, what you see is uh, each of the people who's been killed by a gun in that year actually individually represented by a single gray arc. That's what you see um, in the small image at the top left of the screen. Um, and they, the arcs representing people are traced out one by one. Uh, they start out very slowly so that you can read the identifying information of each of, the, each of those people, but then they get faster and faster until they create the sort of semicircular web that you see in the larger image that we have screenshotted um, on the screen as well. And you know, if, you're, if you have watched it, if you're watching it now, you will, uh, it is, I tend to find it um, you know, really overwhelming um, to the point of it being almost unbearable. Um, like you sort of think it should be done that so many people have died that there can't yet, there can't possibly be more and yet it keeps on going. And that's, you know, that is the point. Um, there are too many people being, being killed by guns in the United States. The reason why it goes on too long is because there are too many people who have died. Now, um, methodologically, it's you know, no less statistically sound than any other study. You know, they publish their methods on the site. Uh, the data about the people derived from a national crime data set released by the federal government. Um, their projected lifespans are determined using a model that comes from the World Health Organization that takes all sorts of regional and demographic information into account. Um, but it was viewed with incredible suspicion from the visualization community because it made us feel. Now, a feminist approach here would say, that's not a problem at all that it made us feel things. And in fact, it's a more compelling visualization precisely because it blends reason with emotion. And once you're able to sort of allow yourself to rebalance emotion and reason, what you find is you have a much more expansive and capacious sort of data communication toolbox. And that in turn lets you focus on what really matters in a design process. So, you know, honoring the context of the data, listening to experience, and taking action or compelling action to challenge these imbalances of power that we find in the world. So if it isn't already apparent, uh, the principles of data feminism apply to every stage of a data science project. Um, so from inception and funding, which actually are particularly important for setting the stage for what happens next, um, to who leads the project, uh, to of course sort of production, circulation, and impact in the world. Um, so it's, it, you know, really involves looking at um, thinking through each stage in this process and thinking through all of those issues of power at each of those stages. Um, oops, I lost my slide, hold on. Um, and this brings us to the final point we wanna make before Q&A, um, which may already be obvious uh, from the examples that we've shown, um, but just to reiterate it here, uh, that data feminism really requires an expanded definition of data science. Um, and so what this means is that we're talking about a data science that isn't defined by the size of the data set, uh, it's not defined by the credentials of the people undertaking the work. Um, these are concerns that are continually used to exclude women and people of color from the field, uh, as well as to exclude work whose contribution is socio-technical rather than purely technical. Um, and what happens when you expand what counts as data science and who counts as a data scientist um, then we can see really clearly that some of the most exciting work in data science today, particularly at the intersection of data science and justice, uh, is being undertaken by artists, by journalists, by humanists, by community organizers, and by activists. Um, and so some of this work does look like traditional data science. So there's this paper here from uh, Margaret Mitchell on um, human reporting bias. Um, 
But then we have a sculpture here in the middle by the artist Stephanie Dinkins, where she trained an AI on an international, sorry, an intergenerational uh, dialogue between herself and her several generations of her black women family members. Um, so it's an AI that has a very idiosyncratic way. We can talk to it, but it has this very idiosyncratic way of, of talking back to you. Um, on the right is the Pudding's uh, inventive and fun data journalism, which is breaking down gender bias in Hollywood screenplays. Um, and then at the bottom is a group called Data Therapy, who uh, works with community-based organizations to develop uh, data murals. Um, and so we have hundreds of examples like this in the book. Um, and uh, we selected these to illustrate the points and also inspire folks to action and inspire them to expand their lens around what and who we consider to be in data science. Um, all right. So uh, we just wanted to end with some actual concrete things you can do in the world. Um, so some of these things involve doing work that interrogates and exposes sexism, racism, and other forces of oppression. Um, examine how these forces show up in your work, um, in data and in the world. Uh, collect counter data and missing data. Introduce new communities to data science and data tools. Use data to advocate for equity at your institution. Um, this is particularly meaningful, I think, in university contexts where there's a lot of not yet collected data that could be used to uh, really generative ends relatively easily because you know we all know the landscape of where we work. Um, experiment with creative forms of data presentation and communication. We didn't talk about that so much in this presentation, but you know, quilts, sculptures, VR, fashion shows. Um, include more people in data-driven projects, especially impacted communities. Uh, center the work of minoritized people and follow their leadership. That last point, point is really key. And then make sure you credit your sources and your research support staff. Uh, make your process transparent and reflect on your own identity. Um, so just a plug for our infographics, uh, we, we were actually invited to present data feminism in an exhibition. So it seems kind of hard to put the book in the exhibition. <laughs> so, uh, so we worked with designer Marcia Diaz and made these uh, the infographics of the principles of data feminism, um, along with some postcards for each principle that explains them. Um, and so these are currently available at the link that's here. Um, and we actually ended up translating them into now five different languages and we're working on a couple of other languages right now. So um, please go check them out and download them. And then here are nine ways to be in touch with us. So sorry, we did not include Snapchat and TikTok, but coming soon. <laughs> um, so I guess I think we can go to the Q&A. <laughs> That was wonderful, Lauren, Catherine. Yay, thank you. Um, we have time now for questions from the audience. Um, and to the audience, you can send us your questions via the Q&A box. We, we already have a lively set of questions um, that have entered that space. Um, and my colleague, Indy Gupta, and I um, will moderate. Um, and I'll read aloud our first question from um, the audience that comes to us from um, Ruby Bell Booth, who asks and says, I am soon to graduate from college as I search for a job. I was wondering how you suggest someone who has relatively little power in the world of data and acts data feminist practice. I'm passionate about using data, just data practices and storytelling with data to create social change, but don't know where to start. What steps or paths would you recommend for someone like me who wants to enact this sort of work in the world? Big question. Great question. Thanks, Ruby. Um, yeah, we. I mean, this is a this is a big one. Um, I, but I think one thing that we feel is that you know you can do feminism for whatever your kind of current position is, right? And so even when you're not like the CEO of the company or the head of the institution or something like that, um, you can still make change. You just have to. Uh, work on it in sort of in slightly different ways than sort of the, the top down policies that are available to you if you're the person in charge. Um, so I think <clears throat> one strategy to start off with is, you know, wherever you land, you know, to first of all think about finding your people because um, none of us do this alone. And it's really important to have um, colleagues. And this work is also hard. 
um, you know, and it, like people like if we look at the case of Dr. Gebru, like people do not always support you. People don't always respond positively to speaking truth to power. This is just, this is the way of the world. And we have all faced this at different points. Um, and so what's really important is to have a sort of supportive network, either in your institution or can be outside of your institution um, where you can vent frustrations, conspire about new things, uh, find joy in the successes um, and kind of keep you going through the work. Um, so I think that's maybe one of the most important things. Um, and yeah, I don't know, Lauren, what would you say? <laughs> no, I think that, I mean, I think that's a really, that's a really good answer. And I think that, you know, one of the things I want to both get a little bit more specific and a little bit more abstract. Um, more specifically, uh, we actually, a, a reader of Data Feminism actually created a Slack for us where people have been posting opportunities pretty regularly um, to a relatively small community. So um, in a minute, I will paste an invite link to that Slack and you should join and there will be specific job opportunities. But the thing that I wanted to say that's a little bit more general is that, you know, the work of feminism is never done, right? It is itself a process, especially when you're trying to engage in the difficult work of being an ally to more minoritized communities or individuals than yourselves, like that is a constant learning process as well. And in that same sort of in that same view, you know, the work that you do in a particular place at a particular time doesn't need to be the culmination of all of your feminist activism or interventions ever, right? Um, you sort of do what you can when you can do it, and you know, remind yourself that it is a you know it is a practice, right? And it is a, a constant struggle, and you will always be be working um, towards greater justice, which in itself sort of is a a thing that you know, given the reality of the world, will never be achieved. Okay, uh, uh, the next question is actually a good segue from the previous one. It comes from Munish Walter Puri, who asks um, if you have explored congruence between your work and other uh, works going on. And some of the other works they mention are Data and Society, Dana Boyd, uh, also Algorithmic Justice League, and then a conference dealing with cognitive biases in visualizations. Yeah, yeah, huge inspiration from um, all of those spaces, for sure. Um, and so I think uh, Algorithmic Justice League uh, was one of the folks that we put up on our kind of inspirations there. Um, and uh, Joy Bolamwini's work in particular has been, I think, extremely important in drawing public attention to some of these issues and, and public attention to what are some of the stakes involved in uh, getting this wrong, so, you know? Um, and then same with Data and Society and Dana Boyd. I mean, one of the things that I really appreciate about Data and Society is really operating as a, a nexus, as a community. Again, like um, thinking in communities. So thinking about like, how do we create spaces where we can learn from each other, conspire together, develop shared values and tactics and things like that. And I really see Data Society as having um, produced that space. And also um, in a similar way to what we're saying about expanding the idea of data science, um, it's been wonderful to see the different kinds of folks who've passed through Data and Society. So they've hosted, like Mimi Onuoha, an artist, was a fellow there, you know? So they're hosting, artists, journalists, you know, kind of broadening the dialogue beyond academia into a number of different disciplines, but also civil society, different professions and things like that. So uh, thanks, yeah. And our next question is from Lauren Britton, who asks, um, or who mentions that we're curious to ask how these examples that you shared throughout the presentation are doing something other than reproducing the kind of violence that minorities are experiencing. So how do these data sets or projects change conditions that produce violence and do something other than just making that visible? Lauren, do you want to start on this? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, I think this is a really important question and I'm really glad that this got asked. Um, you know, I think that this is something that, uh, you need to, the general you needs to be thinking about sort of every single time you begin a data visualization project um, in particular about, or a data collection project. Um, and it's actually something that we thought a lot about in writing the book because, you know, so many of these projects are trying to call attention to a problem and 
in the process of calling attention to the problem, they sometimes and can very easily fall into um, uh, what is sort of colloquial called a deficit narrative, um, this idea that when you are attempting to expose and shed light on a particular issue that is happening, you end up just sort of reinscribing or reinforcing the narrative that this is a group that sort of has problems or needs saving from the outside instead of calling attention to the sort of vitality and activism and agency that is coming up from the members of that group themselves. And, you know, I will say sort of uh, anecdotally, you know, we thought that we had been attentive to this in the writing of the book. And we we can talk about this a little bit later if people are interested, but we posted the, the first draft of the book online. And many people pointed out that we clearly had not been atten attentive to it enough. And they were like, you really need to think about how you are framing some of these issues. And so we did go back um, trying to really take this to heart because I think that it is a little bit of a trap, especially for those of us, and I'm talking about me personally, in relatively privileged positions where we do sort of find ourselves in these roles where our impulse is like, how can we help? What can we do? How can I use my expertise and my authority? And that's the wrong mindset, right? Um, and then the other thing that I'll say is that you know, this isn't to say that you should not, you know, bringing things to light using visual means or calling attention to issues, um, you can still do this when you think hard about how you are deploying these techniques. You know, I do think that, for instance, um, Mimi Onuoha's Library of Missing Data Sets is a really good example of this um, because it is actually making visible gaps or absences in data, right? Um, and it's trying to sort of use presence to call out the exact opposite of this. You know, I will say, um, you know, other ways in which, you know, historically I'm trained as a, a scholar of early American literature. So I deal a lot in my own research um, with the archive of slavery. Um, and this is another issue where um, this comes up a lot. It's like, you are dealing with this originary historical record of the most profound violence that can impact a human, you know, can impact a person. Um, and you're often actually dealing with the evidence of this violence as data, right? You don't have personal accounts. You don't have like video interviews. What you have are, you know, slave ship records. Um, that is, and that is sort of the evidence of this stripping away of humanity. And, you know, what do you do? And, you know, there are a lot of different, uh, different approaches that I think I'll just sort of, sort of summarize as saying it just, you really need to, and you being me at this point, um, needs to constantly attend to your own position um, with respect to the data, which in turn documents sort of like rich human lives that you do not have access to. And asking yourself like, what are my goals? What am I after? Is my work in concert or, you know, in allyship with these broader efforts to sort of reinfuse humanity into these stories or is it something else? And if it's that something else, um, you'd better recalibrate really quickly. Um, and so I think again, you know, to bring back to the sort of the theme that I began by the Q&A by talking about, it is constant. It is a constant, uh, uh, you, you need to engage in a constant effort of holding yourself accountable and asking yourself, you know, what are my goals here? And are these goals the same goals? Are they shared with the groups or the individuals that I, I believe myself to be trying to help? And just to add one last uh, point to that great answer uh, is, is to say like, it's also where we come back to the who question. And, um, you know, as we say over and over again, like who is doing the work really matters and the context from which the work emerges really matters. Like it, it matters deeply, for example, that the anti-eviction mapping project is grounded in the community, working directly with community members uh, in coalition with tenants' rights organizations. It's like a really different originating point uh, than it being based at a research lab at Princeton under the work of one professor. So like th those, those, um, the, those kind of positionalities deeply matter um, and, and will be read uh, by different groups in different ways. And that's kind of what Lauren was alluding to in the book we talk about, uh, for example, how um, uh, it, we talk about maternal mortality data and how like ProPublica did, um, I think really good reporting on shedding light, again, bringing visibility uh, to this idea that we do not have robust maternal mortality data. And there's like these huge disparities, particularly for black women, but 
Um, at the same time, the way in which these kind of white mainstream media organizations portrayed the issue was always as if uh, black women, we have a quote from Kimberly Seals Allers being like, okay, the, the, like, do black women need to be saved? Um, because that's what these narratives are, are kind of depicting is that like, okay, let's all the white people rush in and save the black women. And in fact, uh, black women have been founding organizations and doing visionary leadership on this for decades. <laughs> and they've already, they've always known about the problem. <laughs> and so like, actually what we need is to, you know, elevate, listen to, make space for the leadership of communities on these issues that matter to them. So um, I guess we are at the top of the hour, so maybe we can do two more short questions, um, go a little bit over time. Um, so um, the next question is from Raquel Mendizabal Martel, who asks, what challenges have you encountered when presenting data using data feminism framework to folks who are in power and benefiting from current approaches to data collection and data visualization? I think one, maybe one comes to mind first and then maybe I'll think of something else. But um, one, one thing that we've encountered a couple of times now actually is that we've had folks say, oh, well, this is just good data science. Um, and so when I first encountered that, I was like, yeah, but no. And then I, I couldn't figure out why I felt some dissonance around that. Um, and then after I thought about it further, like, no, it is not just good data science because what sort of passes right now for good data science, the kind of data science, at least that we're um, rewarding with lots of funding and grants and um, promotions um, and that gets traction in technical communities um, is, for the most part, not engaged with any kind of analysis of power. Um, and so like, I think that's, that's been a challenge, I think is sort of just being very clear about this is what distinguishes the feminist approach from good data science or even data science for good, um, right? Is that it actually is really quite different from that. And it means engaging directly and specifically with forces of oppression acknowledging sexism, racism, colonialism, and these various different ways that they show up in different data sets and different communities, often it's very complex, right? Um, and so I think that's, that's maybe the, um, that's, that's maybe been one of the um, challenges there um, is in that like they kind of wanna sweep it under the rug and say, oh, it's just part of good stuff. And this is actually what's happened to a lot of feminist work in academia where it gets swept under the rug and it gets kind of grouped as being critical or something like this. And, um, and then we lose actually the feminist side, which is actually what set it apart in the first place. So, um, so yeah, so I think that's, that's, maybe one, that's maybe one challenge. And, you know, and I think one of the reasons that comes up is actually because it's very, very hard, especially for people in power to talk about power because <laughs> they're benefiting from it. And so like, um, that's why these conversations are uncomfortable. That's why, you know, Dr. Geber is getting fired. <laughs> like, um, these are not pleasant conversations where we can all just go along and be happy with everything. Um, in our last minute or so, and um, Lauren, Catherine, you've been so generous with your time. So thank you for um, allowing us to go over a little bit. Um, we have a question from Jorge Rojas Alvarez, who asks, when we work with communities um, who may not think of themselves as being used to working with data, how do you suggest starting with this kind of work in data science and data justice projects? What tools or approaches could be helpful? Catherine, this one's for you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I think so. I think this is a huge part of um, kind of mitigating these power imbalances in data science is thinking about how do we bring newcomers in, but bring them in in ways that don't make them feel dumb or marginalized or not welcome um, or not related to the, the concerns that they bring from their everyday lives. And so uh, we do have a section of the book that's about uh, teaching data like an intersectional feminist um, and sort of uh, thinking about how we introduce um, different tools and methods. Um, and I have a couple of papers about ideas like creative data literacy. Um, I built some tools to introduce like and, and with some educational activities to introduce things to newcomers. But 
Um, I think one of the big things really is thinking about how do we value the lived experience that people come in with into our learning spaces, whether those are classrooms or workshops or after school programs or something. Um, how do we value their lived experience and use data science to connect with it um, rather than like too often data science is taught and computer science generally sort of taught and um, in a very abstract way, very disconnected from the world. When in fact, at least for me, <laughs> the most exciting things about it are when we can use it to connect to the world, to analyze the world, to make sense of the world. And so how do we use data sets that are uh, grounded in geographies that people understand? How do we use culturally appropriate, uh, you know, examples? Um, and how do we connect, again, connect to kind of what the potential is, like what potential is there for transformation and change like uh, in the world? So uh, yeah, and I'm happy to give more references to you. Catherine, Lauren, thank you so much um, for, for spending this part of the afternoon. I feel like we could keep this discussion going on forever. Uh, according to our questions log in the Q&A box, we could clearly keep this quest, this Q&A session going on forever, but um, for, for respect for your time and for the audience's time, we've got to call an end to things. So thank you so much for, for joining us. And, um, and I want to, that was just wonderful. And we wanted to also take a moment to um, thank our production team and to re-invite our production team to re-video. Um, none of this would have been possible without of the without the back end work of Mitchell Oliver, Jingyi Gu, uh, Vinay Koshi, Gabe Mallow, Jorge Rojas, Adrian Wong, and our ASL translator from um, UIUC's Drez, Drez office, um, Laura and Dee. Thank you so much for um, all of your work. Um, and thank you um, to our audience for, for joining us here today. Um, a note that a, a recording of our talk is going to get posted to our website and also to our Facebook page. Um, so um, feel free to, to revisit, to find those. Um, join us again for our next event with Nate Matias on governing human and machine behavior on March 10th. We hope to see you all there. Um, and thanks again. Yay. Thank you so much. It's an honor. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for listening.